This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good afternoon and welcome to Emory Law School for the second Global Leaders Lecture. I'm Professor Lori Blank and I direct the International Humanitarian Law Clinic here at Emory Law. The IHL Clinic launched the Global Leaders Lecture Series in October 2016 to bring national and international leaders to Emory to engage with our community on front page issues involving national and international security, human rights, military operations, and the rule of law. As lawyers and law students, understanding the law is only one piece of the puzzle. We must also understand the issues behind the law, how law informs decision making and affects people's lives. And our speaker today is a perfect example of this. Here at Emory, we were fortunate a few weeks ago to have a visit from Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor. And when she spoke here, she explained that for her, law is about relationships between people, that the law governs our relationships with each other and it helps make those relationships better, and that the role of the lawyer is to help people improve their relationships with each other. It's hard to imagine a more dramatic space to envision the law in that manner than armed conflict and the national security arena. Indeed, this arena lays bare the intimate connection between the law and the most foundational concepts of and consequences for human dignity. And so today we have a unique opportunity to hear directly about this role for the law and about the intrinsic connection between law and leadership. We're extraordinarily fortunate to have Lieutenant General Charles Petey here to speak with us today. As the Judge Advocate General of the US Army, General Petey is a lawyer and a leader. More specifically, in all military operations, law is a leadership imperative, as we'll hear more about today. General Petey currently serves as the 40th Judge Advocate General of the Army the senior uniformed lawyer in the US Army leading over 10,000 lawyers, paralegals, and legal administrators. Over the course of his illustrious career as a judge advocate, he has deployed to Iraq as the staff judge advocate for US Forces Iraq in Baghdad, to Afghanistan as the staff judge advocate for the 10th Mountain Division during Operation Enduring Freedom, and to Mogadishu, Somalia during Operation Restore Hope in 1993. I will not uh, give a lengthy um, tour of his impressive bio because I want to allow all the time we have today to hear from him. So I'll just add that he also served as the Chief Judge of the Army Court of Criminal Appeals, the Commander of the US Army Legal Services Agency, and the Commanding General of the US Army Judge Advocate General's Legal Center and School. General Petey, we are delighted to welcome you to Emory Law, and it is truly an honor and a privilege for us to have you here today. It's 05 in the morning at a forward operating base in Iraq. The knock comes on the door of your hooch and you're needed in the Joint Operations Center, known as the Jock, immediately. It wouldn't be so bad if you weren't up till 03, reviewing the latest concept of the operations plan for an upcoming mission. You're the Chief of Operational Law for the 1st Armored Division, supporting Operation Inherent Resolve. You can't wave off this knock on your door, you can't call in sick, even though those thoughts never come into your mind. You're needed by the battle staff to assess a target. So you grab your Kevlar and with your night ops non-commissioned officer who woke you up, you move quickly to the jock. As you enter the jock, you see a lot of activity and you see one of your unit's predator feeds, which appears to be locked on a moving truck. You've seen this one before, a dynamic target. So you know what's coming and you know what to do. You start asking questions quickly. You start asking questions of the intel officer, knowing you need some facts before the commander starts peppering you and the staff with questions. Is the driver of the vehicle on our target list? 
What is our degree of certainty? It's that target. Did we actually see him enter the car, or is this from a source? What degree of certainty is, in fact, needed? Who else is in the vehicle? How certain are we of that? Who is our source, if any? Reliable in the past? How many times? Do we know the vehicle? Plates the same as the last time we tracked this target? Who or what is nearby? How soon until they get near the predator's limits on fuel? When do we lose the vehicle in the upcoming village? Oh, wait a minute. We're not tracking the driver. We now understand it's a V-bit, a vehicle improvised explosive device. Not so sure of the driver or occupant? Same questions. How do we know it's a V-bit? Is it bomb-making material or prepped and ready to go and detonate? What's the actual target of the vehicle? Who was the source? How certain are we? All of these questions and more race through your mind in order to give legal advice on whether under current legal authorities you have the right kind and quality of information to target this vehicle under the laws of armed conflict. Is it truly a military target? And is any expected collateral damage that results ex excessive to the concrete military advantage to be gained from striking the target. This, as always, is the foundation of any legal advice you give to the commander. And on cue, your commander, the target engagement authority, begins to pepper you with questions. Judge, we've identified a target. Moving truck, sp suspected VBIT. Can we fire on the truck? What about the occupants? What about the bystanders? What are our collateral damage, our CD minimums? What about calling higher? Do I have the authority at my level to engage this target? Are we good to go? What's your answer? What other information do you need? What other information would you like to have? You thought it was a person being targeted, now you learn it's a V-bit. What if the driver doesn't even know he's driving a V-bit? Does that even matter? What other information do you need? And are you okay to do this analysis on two hours of sleep, six months into a deployment? And so begins another 18 hour day for an army judge advocate. And good morning, good afternoon. Let me pause first now and uh, after that short vignette of a day in the life of an army judge advocate and thank Professor Laurie Blank and Emory School of Law for the kind invitation to speak to you today at the second annual Global Leaders Lecture, a daunting title uh, for which I feel wholly inadequate, but I consider it a great honor to have received the invitation and a special, a very special privilege to join you today. As Professor Blank offered in her very kind introduction, I have the privilege of serving as the 40th Judge Advocate General of the Army, which simply means that I'm the oldest guy in my law firm. And that's okay, I'm all right with that. Uh, it is a very special privilege. I want you to know I consider it a privilege as well to join you to discuss what I believe are some of the most important issues and topics in the world today, frankly, and to share with you really the profound and precedential work uniformed lawyers are doing to shape the law of armed conflict and consequently international law. And of course, no set of remarks by anyone from the Department of Defense is complete without my required disclaimer and indeed, an important one that the views I express today are my own and do not necessarily reflect those of the Department of Defense or the Department of the Army. I begin uh, with the reminder that we've been a nation at war for almost two decades. Over this time, Army judge advocates have, ad have advised commanders in every battle and during every conflict. It's the way your American Army fights and wins with honor. But we don't practice laws you might see in the movies. I don't drive tanks, we don't fly jets, we don't drive boats, and we don't tell commanders which targets to shoot. And most importantly, we don't make those decisions. Those are fundamentally commanders' decisions. So anytime you hear someone complain about lawyers making decisions on the battlefield, tying the hands of commanders, it's honestly hogwash. It's a fundamental misunderstanding of the facts and the way we operate. It's a facile way to blame what is really in the crosshairs. 
it's the law itself, or some national policy, or frankly, in my experience, the collision between what our baser instincts may want to do, call it your evil twin, and what the right thing to do is. These two particular dynamics are very jealous of each other. So I'm here to talk to you today about what the role of the real judge advocate is in modern military operations, how lawyers continue to support your military's effort to comply with the fundamental principles of the law of armed conflict during a period of ever-changing, ever-changing battlefield complexity, and how the notion of legitimacy has become paramount during those operations and, in, frankly, everything we do. Much of what I have to say to you today comes from my personal experience over 30 years of practice and from constant observation and learning from experts like Professor Blank. And so let me just offer this observation as well. I'd like you to remember at least one thing that I tell you today, and I'm a realist. I know it's impossible to expect you to remember everything I talk about. But if you remember one thing, it is this, that you must be a lifelong, lifelong learner, recognizing that the older you get, the less you know. Because every day, if you're listening, as a good lawyer will, you'll be exposed to more new and different ideas, so that your ignorance, frankly, expands every day. But your knowledge of that ignorance inspires you to learn. And it is Professor Blank, and so many like her, especially in this institution, that challenge us to learn with new ideas and new ways of looking at the law and the world, which makes all of us, especially those of us in uniform, better. So remember, first and always, as soon as you think you know something, that too is your evil twin talking. Brush the evil twin off and keep learning. Mark Twain was fond of saying that when he was 17 in his youth, he knew everything and he was shocked at how stupid his old man was. It seemed like the dumbest guy in town, his father. He went on to say that by the time he'd reached the age of 25, he couldn't believe how much his father had learned in just a short eight years. Not only must we insist on constant learning, we must, like Twain, like Mark Twain, recognize that those who've got a bit of experience under their belt may just know a thing or two that we don't. Now today, I propose to talk about my law firm, the oldest law firm in the United States, and if I may say, the best law firm in the United States. I'm very proud of it. He's got, he's got a mess to clean up, and that's okay too. We do everything in the JAG Corps from identifying the legal framework for an operation, think a UN resolution or a congressional authorization for the use of military force, to assisting commanders with targeting and compliance with basic LOAC, law of armed conflict principles, say the proportionality analysis in Mosul street fighting. Second, I want to talk to you uh, and take a deep dive into how U.S. forces comply with basic LOAC principles during operations. And third, I'd like to talk to you about the unknown next fight and how we preserve what I would refer to as our legal maneuver space on the battlefield as we shift away from a counterterrorism fight to a near peer or peer to peer, peer, peer to peer fight. And finally, I want to highlight how the notion of legitimacy, that is compliance with the LOAC, is now a recognized principle of warfare, like unity of command, mass, and surprise on the battlefield, how the principle of legitimacy helps to shape ultimate victory in today's complex battle space. So let me first begin by talking about the Judge Advocate General's Corps. It is, in fact, a single organization made up of about 10,000 lawyers, paralegals, and legal administrators. Our law firm was first organized by George Washington in 1775, frankly, just three weeks after he entered Boston on the 3rd of July, 1775. As you know, his army, his, dis his army's discipline problem was a severe problem for him, and courts martial were needed. So he asked Congress to create the position that I now occupy. And so from the very first days of our American army, the JAG Corps that we know now was focused on helping commanders enforce the law, whether it's domestic or international law. 
Today, 242 years later, our core of uniformed members of commissioned, warrant, and non-commissioned officers, junior enlisted soldiers, are members of the active component, the Army Reserve, and the National Guard. We're also members of two honorable professions, the profession of arms and the profession of law. Like every Army organization, the primary mission of the Corps, of the JAG Corps, is to support the warfighter. Judge advocates assist commanders with understanding how the law of armed conflict applies, how the Freedom of Information Act applies to, let's say, disciplinary records, whether a request for offers of a contract complies with the competition and contracting laws, and whether an allegation of rape, for example, should be prosecuted. Army lawyers provide legal counsel to soldiers and their families, boosting morale and allowing soldiers to stay focused on their mission. Most importantly, the Judge Advocate General's Corps provides the structure and support for maintaining and enforcing discipline, the foundation of any effective fighting force. And while Judge Advocates practice law in virtually every part of the law, today I want to focus particularly on the role of Judge Advocates during combat operations. It was Yogi Berra who once said, if you don't know where you're going, you might wind up someplace else. And lawyers, in almost any practice area, help their client understand the landscape. The 30,000 foot aerial view, along with where the 50 meter target fits into that view. Context, where you are and where you're going, as we say, is everything. In combat, it matters whether your authority is based on, in its simplest terms, a declaration of war or a UN resolution to keep the peace. The former would allow a commander to kill an enemy soldier wherever he might find one, whatever he might be doing. The latter, the peacekeeping Unsker, would only allow the commander to kill, that is to use deadly force, if the soldier was threatened with deadly force himself. Dramatically different results based on context. So you can see even in the most basic paint by numbers that the authority under which the army operates is step one. And as you might guess, it's never as simple as what I've just described. So let me explain. Judge advocates begin with what you study in the classroom. That is, the notion of use ad bellum or use in bello. The legal basis for an operation, use ad bellum. And of course, use in bello, how our commanders conduct daily operations in the field and on the battlefield. Scholars will often keep use ad bellum and use in bello as distinct areas of the law. At an academic level, this makes perfect sense. But on a practical level, the legal basis for the operation, that legal basis upon which policymakers initially determined to use force as a means of external relations, does indeed have an impact on the analytical framework of a commander's daily operations. The legal basis for the operation provides a context for interpretation of higher commander's intent. It may impact what constitutes reasonable or proportionate action and provides a baseline message, for example, for content, message content for strategic communications or daily media engagements. Indeed, it will often set the policy framework for how we further constrain, further constrain the law of armed conflict. You see this in the issuance of rules of engagement or tactical directives that as a policy tell a commander the Low Act may allow for this much collateral damage, but we actually won't allow for more than this as a matter of policy. This example, initial, for example, initial US operations in Afghanistan were heavily influenced by the legal basis as operations were based in part on two exceptions. One, Article 2-4 of the UN Charter, self-defense, and a, a United Nations Security Council, Chapter 7, authorized operation, ISAF in that case, with a mandate to provide stability to the Afghan government. While the early operations may have seen more latitude in the use of LOAC principles, as the theater matured and operations continued, further restrictions were put in place to limit damage to person and property, although the legal basis for presence had not, in fact, changed. So context matters every day. Once an operation is authorized, judge advocates ensure compliance with the LOAC, Law of Armed Conflict, 
during the conflict. That's your use in bellow, as you know. Typically what we call through the targeting process. As a matter of US national policy, and as set out in our Department of Defense Law of War Manual, the United States abides by LOAC principles to guide our conduct. We view these four principles as a coherent system working interdependently and self-reinforcing. And you've likely heard of these concepts, which are really our traffic signs, our rules of the road. Military necessity, the first such concept, allows and also limits our operations to only those actions that are against military objectives, not civilian objects those objectives that are necessary to defeat the enemy as quickly and efficiently as possible. Proportionality requires that even when actions may be justified by military necessity, that the harm or damage must not be excessive to the expected military advantage to be gained. The principle of distinction hangs like a ceiling over all these principles in that it requires a soldier to distinguish between a military objective, a tank, an enemy soldier, or what we would hope would be an obvious bad guy in the civilian population. You can see just over the last 100 plus years of war that this notion of distinction, while at the heart of LOAC, is perhaps the hardest to comply with on the modern battlefield. Of course, that is because if you want to use a soldier's compliance with LOAC against him, you'll intentionally confuse the notion of distinction. That is, you'll look like a civilian when conducting operations. And as you know from your studies, this is the most dangerous and hard, hardest problem set on the battlefield today. It was General Douglas MacArthur who said, the soldier above all others prays for peace, for it is the soldier who must suffer and bear the deepest wounds and scars of war. I think of this sentiment when I think of the fourth principle in the LOAC panoply of principles, and that is the emphasis on humanity and the prohibition on unnecessary suffering. This principle forbids actions unnecessary to, see, to achieve a particular end. I can use lead bullets, which can be seen on x-rays as a soldier, but I cannot use glass munitions, which cannot be seen on x-rays, a classic example. The use of glass munitions would be in violation of the principle of unnecessary suffering or humanity, as it would cause unnecessary and additional suffering and would not contribute to defeating the enemy. These four principles, distinction, military necessity, proportionality, and unnecessary suffering are incorporated by our commanders with the help of their judge advocates throughout military operations, and specifically during the targeting process. So let's move to that. My second point focuses on the preservation of legal maneuver space on the battlefield. Preserving legal maneuver space is the effort to preserve the right of our commanders under international law and LOAC principles to take necessary actions that are lawful under LOAC. We know that US forces and our allies have restricted based on wholesome and thoughtful policy and or strategy decisions the use of lethal force as part of our counterterrorism fight in Afghanistan and Iraq. This has been done to minimize harm to non-combatants and to sustain host nation support. I'm talking about appropriately self-imposed restrictions like tactical directives, rules of engagement, weapons restrictions that we've properly imposed as national policy. They're often more restrictive than the LOAC would require, but absolutely necessary given our profound concern for the impact on non-combatants and the nature of the counterterrorism conflict and the spaces we operate in. We also have such rules because of our relationship with the host nation and also our relationship with our coalition partners. But my point in legal maneuver space is that we may not always be in a counterterrorism fight. We may be in a peer-to-peer -peer fight, and we must understand that the last 17 years of CT operations and the proper policy restraints we've imposed may not be possible, wise, or prudent on battlefield next. Therefore, lawyers and practitioners must understand what the actual LOAC standard is and where our policy has further restricted the law. The legal maneuver space I'm referring to then is, as lawyers, knowing with absolute clarity where the law ends and where policy begins. Or said differently, where prudent policy in this particular setting will stop us and how much further the actual LOAC will take us. 
This will be critical in battlefield next, and it may mean the difference in seconds between life and death. Preserving this space is critical. The reason is because academic experts, non-governmental organizations, will sometimes seek to impose restrictions on the use of force by espousing their own version of the law of armed conflict as the law, when in fact it's just their interpretation of what the law is or what they think it should be. Now the wise, attentive listener to my remarks might think I'm speaking with forked tongue. You said we must be lifelong learners and realize we benefit from new and different ways of thinking about the law. And I'm the greatest adherent of this, one of life's greatest pursuits. There is in fact significant and salutary contributions to the study of LOAC and they should be applauded. What I'm saying is that good lawyers insist on the distinction between where the law ends and where opinion actually begins. Lawyers know the difference between an editorial and a statute, an opinion piece and a legal precedent. Wildly different things to be sure, both absolutely essential to the development of thought and the law, but profoundly different, and profoundly different on the battlefield. LOAC is that body of law based on state practice, not aspiration or opinion. Like any state criminal code, it is an extant body of law as written or practiced. Our legal maneuver space then on any given battlefield is the delta between our policy limits in a given theater of operation and what the LOAC proscribes. So we must, as lawyers, be highly nuanced practitioners and be relentlessly rigorous in where policy begins and where the law sets its outer limits. Our behavior is delimited by what the law and policy is, not by what we wish it to be. It is not the law because I've published a persuasive article on a topic with an interpretation everyone agrees with. Even after 10 articles on the same subject are published saying the same thing, as we know, that is not law. It may be a wonderful intellectual discussion, but not law. It may be in a very real challenge, forgive me, this is the very real challenge in our high-speed digital age, where communication saturation and crowdsourcing changes public policy seemingly overnight. Thus, for lawyers, there is a very real danger that the drumbeat of published works in the absence of new or fresh state-driven lawmaking will be mistaken for actual law. Let me give you a few troubling examples. Take, for example, the ICRC's push to minimize or eliminate explosives in cities. Certainly a laudable goal in its intent, that is prohibiting the use of explosives in cities. But the ICRC's proposal is possibly more dangerous from a soldier's perspective than the explosives at the root of their concern. The ICRC has a simple and effective, quite honestly, a very simple and effective video that portrays the ripple effects of explosives in cities. From dropping buildings to cutting off water and power as a result, which causes displacement of persons, and the ability to keep blood banks open and operating, miles away from the explosion. It purports to then suggest that such explosives are therefore unlawful, and that the law actually forbids such means of warfare given the disproportionate consequences of explosives to the military advantage gained. What do we make of this drumbeat? Is it law or mere aspiration of a well-intended interest group? Let me be very clear. The suggested restrictions in the ICRC video are not the law, not part of treaty, not part of custom or state practice. That we've been able to employ precision weapons in a counterterrorism fight over the last 17 years with extraordinary rigor and concern for not combatants, I might add, is a blessing not a set of handcuffs established by the law. We still manufacture dumb bombs. We manufacture dumb bombs because our next enemy may be actually be a conventional force that requires explosives, whether in the open or, regrettably, in cities. Enemy formations may take up positions in cities, in buildings. Why? Because it's an effective defensive position in warfighting. So we must be very conscious to understand the law must operate in all settings, not just our last CT setting. 
Furthermore, we all know soldiers are the first to avoid war and want to avoid a fight in a city. The reasons are obvious, of course, because it's the soldier's lot voluntarily, voluntarily to bear the costs of those decisions to go to war. But cities are dicey things. Cities are hard to take from the enemy. Mosul and Raqqa are two good modern examples. Full of obstacles and hiding places and protection, we don't like to see things broken and destroyed. But if armies can't use certain weapons like explosives in cities, more people die, and the fight for the city takes even longer. Every building must be entered by a stack of four, six, ten soldiers, your brothers and sisters. Every door must be broken open. Every room must be entered and cleared of not only the enemy, but the enemy's booby traps. More soldiers will die, more civilians will die, and the battle will take longer if explosives were unlawful. That, sadly, is the ugly reality of war. The intent is laudable. The effect is unworkable. Another example. There are those who write that in targeting, commanders should be held accountable for the damage they actually cause if it is shown later in time that the targeting actually caused more damage than the advantage gained. This is an ex post facto analysis of a commander's decision making. This, of course, is not the law at all under the law of armed conflict. Commanders' targeting decisions, their conclusions on proportionality, can only be judged by the legal standard recognized by LOAC. Was the decision in this case honest and reasonable under the circumstances known by the commander at the time he or she made the decision? That is the legal standard. To hold a commander responsible for that which he or she didn't know is not the law and frankly would paralyze the warfighter. And of course, one of the peskiest issues on the modern battlefield when we talk about legal maneuver space is organized armed groups. When may a member of such a group be targeted with lethal fires? You all know the terms of art, direct participation in hostilities. This DPH nomenclature subjects an otherwise protected person, a civilian, someone who would appear to be a protected civilian, to lethal force if they directly participate in hostilities. This topic is full of commentary and wise and thoughtful commentary indeed. It makes this one of the most difficult aspects of the modern battlefield. Knowing what our national view of what the law is and how our state practice views this notion is critical for modern, modern battlefield lawyers. Suffice it to say that the ICRC might suggest the standard is one of a continuous combat function. The US view, however, is that membership or and or an informal functional, functional analysis is what the law actually requires. And this is what forms our state practice. I'm not suggesting this is simple. In fact, it is quite challenging. But this is the legal maneuver space we must ensure is ours so that deliberately asymmetric enemies are not unfairly advantaged by a deliberate and consistent non-compliance with the recognized rules of war. This topic alone could occupy an entire set of remarks, so suffice it to say that lawyers, especially uniformed lawyers, and commanders must understand the law as it is, not how some others might wish it to be. The real danger of drumbeat opinion is that people will mistake opinion for law. In an era where it is harder to get international agreement, between nations on the law, the problem is magnified. Interested parties push harder to gain compliance with aspirations. They publish more. And soon, the only thing a practicing lawyer can find on precautions or warnings in the attack are seven articles that purport to require certain warnings. Warnings that may not, in fact, be legally required. The practical effect on the ground a commander may choose not to return fire on a legitimate target because of confusion and potential risk if he is wrong about the law. Indeed, this hesitation or confusion may be the goal of the writer, but it may spell disaster on the battlefield. The Low Act tolerates far more than we are accustomed to in our day and our age. 
And this is the legal maneuver space that we must, as lawyers, preserve. That we have been able to minimize harm in certain settings by self-imposed restrictions and leveraging our technology does not mean the rule book has been rewritten while our restraint is laudable and much to be desired. It is a matter of national choice because it makes sense and it is the right thing to do in that particular setting. It may not always be possible and the LOAC allows for this. Two recent articles that I commend to you were written by judge advocates and published in the Joint Forces Quarterly and they highlight our effort to preserve this legal maneuver space that I highlight for you. The first is the use of explosives in cities, a grim but lawful reality of war authored by the former Deputy Judge Advocate General of the Army, who is now the General Counsel for the United States Air Force, General Tom Ayers. Also uh, published was an article entitled, Follow the Money, Targeting Enemy War-Sustaining Activities, Activities, co-authored by Colonels Jeff Miller and Jan Corey. The first article addresses current calls by NGOs for a complete ban on the use of explosives in populated areas. General Ayers eloquently points out how the LOAC already requires commanders or anyone ordering offensive action in an urban area to make careful assessments in order to prevent an impermissible loss of life or injury to civilians or damage to civilian objects. And that in reality, the ICRC effort to go beyond what the LOAC already requires by banning explosives would protract conflicts, quote, increase casualties on all sides to include innocent civilians and turn populated areas into rubble as a consequence of rooting out the enemy house to house. And I agree. The second article addresses the successful execution of the campaign to deprive ISIS of its war-sustaining oil revenue by targeting trucks used to generate income through hauling ISIS oil. The article highlights how the U.S.'s broad definition of military objective under the LOAC allowed U.S. forces to target civilian oil trucks in so much as that activity directly contributed to the Islamic State's financial ability to sustain its war effort. The result of this lawful, albeit minority, view created the requisite maneuver space that allowed the commanders on the ground to successfully target Islamic State war-sustaining oil enterprise income used to fund the military operations, pay its warfighters, and purchase weapons. These two articles are at the forefront of our effort to preserve legal maneuver space in accordance with the principles of the law of armed conflict. Again, I, I emphasize the importance of not being constrained by the previous fight. We must guard against any erosion of our commander's ability to fight and win quickly and with honor and under the Low Act to take reasonable, lawful, legitimate actions in the next fight. My third point, legitimacy on the modern battlefield, intimately related to the point that I just discussed. In 2011, our Department of Defense published and elevated the idea of legitimacy to an actual principle of war, like mass and surprise. Traditionally, principles of war included things like unity of command, surprise, mass, as I've mentioned, including legitimacy as a principle of war represents a recognition of the overarching value of conducting operations consistent with the LOAC. Our national emphasis on legitimacy also underscores the role that perceived compliance or non-compliance with LOAC can play in complex battle spaces. Our focus greatly impacts our targeting and planning calculus with respect to collateral damage and civilian casualties. In today's era of fast-paced electronic communication, allegations of improper acts can be sent around the world in seconds, as we all know, even before preliminary investigations can begin. U.S. and international tolerance for civilian casualties is lessened dramatically over time. As I've already described, the evolution of precision munitions and other technologies have increased our ability to be more discriminating in targeting enemy forces, thus minimizing civilian casualties. An increased expectation, therefore, of minimal to even no civilian casualty on modern battlefields renders any casualty that much more conspicuous. Our emphasis, our national emphasis on legitimacy also affects how our enemies interact with us. Because our enemies know our society places a premium on respecting the rule of law, they carefully and deliberately seek opportunities to attack our plans and actions as illegal and even immoral. 
or they criticize our conduct as being contrary to the law of war. Our enemies perceive our focus on legitimacy as a vulnerability to exploit and as a method of undermining our center of gravity, namely the support of the American people and our legitimacy with the host nation or the international coalition or community of nations. Our enemies undoubtedly understand that the legitimacy of our military actions in the modern era rests on perceived compliance with the LOAC. They seek to exploit that through their behavior of commingling with civilians or using civilians as human shields. In contrast to the Second World War, where instances of civilians being used as human shields were rare, today the practice is becoming widespread among many organized armed groups in non-international armed conflicts. The Taliban, for example, have continuously employed a strategy of provoking or exploiting civilian casualties in order to challenge the legitimacy of coalition operations. ISIS, as we know, has made it their calling card. If legitimacy is the key, then we really do need to know what the rule set is. Clarity of the law is important for commanders and lawyers, particularly in a complex battle space where traditional linear battle lines are non-existent. It is equally important that the law of armed conflict provide no incentive to state or non-state actors to violate it. Regarding asymmetries, the DOD Law of War Manual emphasizes that a party to a conflict does not benefit from shielding their operations among the civilian population. In fact, the manual emphasizes that the party to a conflict that engages in shielding is responsible for any harm. Not only does such a rule promote humanitarian concerns by discouraging armies from jeopardizing the lives of innocents, but it also provides clarity, necessary clarity to commanders in those complex battle spaces who confront this horrible behavior. In a similar vein, transparent investigations are mechanisms through which we can maintain legitimacy on our battlefields. How our commanders, soldiers, and their counsel understand the law, apply it, and hold ourselves accountable rests at the center of our legitimacy. Proper, thorough investigations and accountability are central. As we approach the 50th anniversary of the My Lai Massacre two weeks from now, we must remember the important lessons of that terrible, dark period. These lessons run deep, I can assure you, in the United States Army. Finally, there's another more personal reason to ensure clarity of law as we train and reinforce honor and legitimacy, and that is the U.S. soldier, the soldier, him or herself. Imagine the 19-year-old infantryman. He's well-trained, but scared. He's on patrol. He sees the enemy, whether in uniform or civilian, shooting at him continue to deliberately violate the law. Human shields, perfidy, summary executions, mutilations of his buddies and the innocent, hidden booby traps, the most brutal and terrifying images in his mind play over and over again. And what does this young infantryman say to us? I'll do the same to them as they have done to me. Why not? There are no rules in war. You're living in a dream world. Spend a day in my boots, on patrol, on point. See the horror I see every day, and then tell me what the law really says. The law is about survival, and that's it. Isn't that reality? Are those the words of, of a professional American soldier? Of course not. They are not. And don't ever let a movie or a book or a bad set of circumstances change your mind about that. And no, I'm not naive. I've been doing this for 30 years. The instincts to abandon the law can be strong. The instincts to survive and do unto them as they do to you are strong. We've seen it happen, and I am proud to say as an American soldier, when we discover such things, we hold such people accountable. And thankfully, those are rare instances indeed. But that is where the law and our focus on legitimacy come to play. It is the job of leaders and lawyers to ensure the rules are known and followed, 
that legitimacy is woven within the very fabric of our training, mission, operations, and everything we do. It is our culture of honor and legitimacy and compliance and accountability. It is why I stand before you today and talk about such notions as your armies, your armies, senior uniformed lawyer. Because what we choose to talk about is what's important. And this brings to my mind Lieutenant Jim McDonough, who wrote of his time in Vietnam in his book, Platoon Leader, a memoir of command. And what a contrast to the events of My Lai and what was going through the mind of another platoon leader in the same conflict. Quote, Lieutenant McDonough writes, I had to do more than keep them alive. I had to preserve their human dignity. I was making them kill forcing them to do the most uncivilized of acts, but at the same time, I had to keep them civilized. That was my duty as their leader. They were good men, but they were facing death, and men facing death can forgive themselves many things. War gives the appearance of condoning almost everything, but men must live with their actions for a long time afterward. A leader has to help them understand that there are lines they must not cross. He is their link to normalcy, to order, to humanity. If the leader loses his own sense of propriety or shrinks from the duty, anything will be allowed and anything can happen." End quote. His words transcend time and battlefields as they cut to the heart, the very heart of the matter. We as commanders and lawyers alike, leaders must ensure those lines are not crossed and we must ensure that those lines are lawful legitimate and clear. On another battlefield, at another time, a platoon of US infantry were returning from a mission to rescue the crew of a downed aircraft. While returning on foot through city streets, they began taking fire from a hospital, from a hospital. They returned focused fire on the windows where they were receiving fire from but it was so intense they were pinned down and could not move. They couldn't go forward or whence they came. They ended up blasting a hole in the compound wall behind them to extricate. Shortly after returning, the battalion commander called his JAG to come talk with the platoon. He was concerned they'd lost sight of the meaning of their mission. Who was a lawful target and what the limits of violence were. They were scared, angry, and ready to kill anything in his concerned battalion commander's mind. But that is the difference between a mob and a professional army. The soldiers were under control, professional, and they were ready to reset. The commander talked to them, I talked to them, and they were, as a result, ready to perform their next mission as American soldiers. And so now back to the jock, the operations center in Iraq that we started with. You remember, you're being peppered by questions with a commander. And what did you do? What did you advise? You apply the LOAC principles to the facts as they develop. You advise the commander to consider the intelligence available to determine whether the VBID was a lawful military objective. It was. You advise that he must distinguish the VBID as a military object by civilian. You did. The intel was solid. The occupants were bad guys. We had the right vehicle. The source was reliable. There were no known family members in the truck. The truck was in a remote part of the country, but if we wait too long, it would enter a city and the complications of a strike would magnify. You advised that any CD, collateral damage, or expected injury to civilians would not be excessive in relation to the military advantage to be gained. In this case, the CD was minimal, the roadway, the crops bordering the roadway. No other cars were in the vicinity. This particular engagement turned out to be one of the easier ones. This is the LOAC you study in the classroom. This is its application on the battlefield. This is the American soldier in harm's way doing the right thing to preserve our legitimacy and his or her own sense of humanity and dignity. Army lawyers ensure a clear, unequivocal understanding of the law so that commanders and soldiers may operate with confidence in these very difficult environments where the enemy operates in direct contravention of the recognized rules of war. It is at that moment that our adherence to the rules must resonate like a klaxon. And we must be very clear about it, even in the face of tragedy, 
the tragedy that is war. When we have failed in our obligations under the law, we do the right thing, an honorable thing, and investigate and, and transparently hold those to account who are responsible and avoid repetition. And while our rules attempt to minimize its horrors, we must be strong enough and wise enough to remind those who would sit in judgment that war, even when conducted within the rules, is an ugly thing. Our solemn task, our solemn task together, is to bring conflict to a close as quickly in, in accordance with the rules as possible. We must ensure we don't impose the wrong rules on the next fight. It was our very first president, George Washington, who first, whose first wish was to see, quote, this plague of mankind, war, banished from the earth. But he too knew that until banished, it would have to be done with relentless speed and vigor and always in compliance with the recognized rules of war. It was George Washington himself who directed in his first campaign, any prisoners who may fall into your hands, you will treat with as much humanity and kindness as may be consistent with your own safety and public interest. Be very particular in restraining not only your own troops, troops, but the Indians from all acts of cruelty and insult, which will disgrace the American arms and irritate our fellow subjects against us. 1775. Animating the law of armed conflict is the soul of our nation. To do what is right because it's the right thing to do and because it will win the peace faster. Because of our human condition, we are not perfect in this. But the law remains our map and our compass set on true north by our first and best general. Americans shall always fight our enemies according to the law. That is what Americans do best. But our first order of business as lawyers is to know the law. For that, there is no substitute. Where it begins and where the law ends. That is the rule and the role of law. That is the true test of an army lawyer and frankly, for any lawyer. And I commend that to you to be your test. Thank you very much.